Did you know that African Americans are more likely to use Twitter than white Americans? According to the Pew Research Center, 22% of African Americans online are Twitter users compared to 16% of white Americans online. We'll discuss this and other interesting facts about racism and resistance in the digital age with Dr. Rob Eichmann on this episode of The Curious Professor. everyone, I'm Dr. B. Welcome to the Curious Professor podcast, where I take listeners on a journey of discovery to explore the people, places, artifacts, and natural wonders that spark my curiosity. On this episode of the Curious Professor podcast, we'll explore racism and online abuse with Dr. Rob Eichmann. But first, a trivia question. What percentage of adults in the USA use Facebook and Instagram? I'll have the answer for you at the end of this episode. I'm thrilled to have Dr. Rob Eichmann on the show today. Dr. Eichmann, a distinguished writer, educator, filmmaker, and scholar, delves into the transformative impact of technology and online communication on our experiences and responses to racism. By shining a light on the mechanisms of racism, he aims to raise consciousness and promote resistance efforts with his timely book, When the Hood Comes Off, Racism and Resistance in the Digital Age, Welcome to the show, Rob. It's great to have you here. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with you. What's the most unique thing about you? Oh, my goodness. You know, I think um, I I am someone who is equally as passionate about doing research as I am about playing sports um, and as I am about reading science fiction fantasy and then again, playing video games. And so I think that I'm I'm well-rounded in a strange way where, where it's, uh, you know, I have few friends who are, who are interested in everything that I'm interested in. Um, so, <laughs> so I, yeah, hopefully that counts. You've stated that you study online abuse for a living. What sparked that interest? I would say it was my first year of grad school. I was reading, um, did some reading about colorblind racism theory and this idea that racism had become more subtle in the years following the end of the Jim Crow or the classic years of the civil rights movement. And I just saw that as being not the case in many spaces that I was just occupying, um, you know, as a, as a young man um, in my own time. So from playing video games and and seeing how, um, you know, how, how often I I would be exposed to explicit forms of racism to saying things in uh, other various online spaces. And so it just, you know, it, it, it really allowed me to shape this, intellectual question of, of of wanting to understand that contradiction and explore that contradiction and to figure out how do people make sense of racism online and how does it impact the way that they think about themselves and, and the world. And can you give us a definition of what colorblind racism is and how it fits in with the research that you're doing? Yeah. So um, colorblind racism is this idea that people can be racist without hating black folks or other groups of color. Um, and so before, right during the Jim Crow era, old fashioned racism was in your face. People would admit it. Um, one of the stories I tell kind of to illustrate this difference in when the hood comes off is um, of an of a old classic sociological study where a sociologist sent a survey to 250 restaurants around the United States in the 30s or 40s and asked them, would you serve an Asian person or a Chinese person? And um, of the 250, something like 249 um, said, no, we would not. But then when they went and visited all those different restaurants, the exact ones that were sent the survey, only one of the 250 turned them away. And so people were much more willing to admit that they are racist than they were to act on it. And I think nowadays we we have the inverse, where if you sent out a survey to different restaurants or night you know nightlife venues, no one is going to respond by saying we do not allow people of color in our space. They would be shut down. It's illegal to do that, right? But in practice, there's a lot of research on nightlife 
and how you know different nightlife venues will institute rules um, about clothing to try and keep the population from you know being black and so whether it's from from a, you know, not wearing a certain type of hat to not wearing a certain type of T-shirt to not wearing certain types of shoes that you have anti-blackness that is hidden um, when people are not willing to admit it. And so I think that that's what colorblind racism is talking about is how do we understand racism, you know, 75 years after it went out of style, 75 years after people stopped being comfortable telling us when they're racist, how do we detect it even still? And so it, it, it's the ways that, that racist systems and racial inequality are upheld without anyone ever having to resort to hate. That You don't have to hate black folks. You just have to believe that the reason so many black people are in jail is because you know, of cultural differences or differences in, in parenting and differences in, in personal choices, as opposed to being just, you know, evidence of racism. Your book that you're promoting right now is called When the Hood Comes Off, Racism and Resistance in the Digital Age. This book examines how racism manifests online and highlights the anti-racist tactics rising to oppose it. So what motivated you to specifically write this book? You know, so I think that the the piece, right, I, I mentioned before wanting to study this contradiction, right? And that's that's how I started the study is I wanted to understand how racism was different online and really explain that. And something that was unexpected when I started this study was learning how young folks of color were not shying away from, from you know, more explicit expressions of racism online. They weren't scared. And instead, they started using digital tools to fight back in new and innovative ways. And so the se second half of this book is something that I did not expect, but that really, you know, excites me. And it's probably my favorite part of what I found is, is the ways that people are challenging racism um, and, 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 you know, in, in ways that I think that are, are unpredictable. So, for example, the most common way to respond to a racial microaggressions or racial slights is just to not respond. But what I found online is that young students of color feel more comfortable challenging racism online than they do in person, that they say it happens more online than it, than it does in person, that they feel empowered when they witness people shut down racists and racism online, whether it's subtle or overt in ways that make them right, like reassure them that, that this is not something that, that we are allowing to happen and experiencing in silence, which, again, is the norm in face to face settings. And so I think that that is, you know, the reason why I'm, I'm telling this story about resistance is because it it is what I found to be happening. Um, and even though I didn't go into the study to, you know, to, to learn about resistance, you know, the, 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 as it, as it came out, um, I, I realized I needed to follow the data. I need to follow the, you know, the findings and, and really uh, what I'm doing in the book is I'm telling a story um, that, you know, that was shared with me from, you know, 80 different students, more than 80 students at five different cities from Los Angeles, Chicago, Atlanta, Boston, and New York, um, telling their stories from their college campuses. And then I, you know, also have a decade of Twitter data. I'm telling the stories of, of, of how the things that I found through interviews are playing out in broader, you know, um, internet uh, settings. Were you examining other social media or was it primarily Twitter? Yeah. So when I conducted interviews, I, I would I would uh, allow the students to tell me where they were living online. And so I didn't go into it to study one platform. So they would tell me about things that happened on Facebook. They would tell me about blogs that they followed that had really you know changed the, the way they thought about things or, or helped them develop their own political consciousness. Um, you know, and, and actually very few students talked about Twitter. Um, and so a, a couple mentioned having Twitter profiles, but for the most part, they're talking about Facebook and Instagram blogs and Reddit and forums um, is where they were where, where, where they were living. And so I bring in Twitter because of the type of space that it's been for activists and, and, and has kind of driven some of the mainstream recognition of anti-racist online conversations. Um, but so that right. But, but again, that, that I'm trying to tell a comprehensive story. And so I talk with the students about where they live and then I go and, and explore another space online that uh, where I'm not following the same interviewees to that space, but I'm more looking at more public engagement there. And you discuss the importance of Black Twitter in your book. Can you tell us more about what that means to you? And you mentioned that younger people may not be using Twitter as much. Do you feel like it's an age difference between maybe adults in their 30s and 40s who are using Twitter as opposed to college students? Um, you know, somewhat, I think, I think that, that in part it's because I was more focusing on, 
um, the connection between online conversations and everyday life. And so that, that really is the reason why I went to the college campus is that the people that they're engaging with online are the people that they're in class with. And so that brings a different sense of, of reality, right? So oftentimes we feel like we're divorced from what happens online, that, that we have a separate digital world versus a physical world. And I feel the college campus is where they come to, together in a, in a way that is um, most clear because they're, right, they're so connected. Whereas Twitter, the folks who have Twitter, you're largely engaging with people who you may not know them in 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 real life. That these are folks who are using the same hashtag as you, um, right? So that that's where that discussion is coming from, as opposed to being, you know, your friends that you right are held accountable for what, the things that you say online. Um, and so that like that that is is part of where where I see that difference. Um, I think that there we can look at some demographic trends, and folks on Twitter tend to be a little bit more educated and things like that. But right, still, but you know, black folks are are overrepresented on Twitter. Black Twitter is a powerful space. Um, it's, you know, the, the definitions that I use in the book come from Andre Brock and Trusty Cotton and Cotton. Um, and, and, you know, they, they talk about Twitter's being more than just a community. It's being kind of a cultural repository. It's a space where, where blackness is performed. Um, and right. And, 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 and folks are engaging from everything from, you know, talking about racism to talking about TV shows that, that we're watching, um, together. Um, and, and, and um, and, you know, it, it's funny because I think like, uh, the, you know, one, one of the things I say in the book is that black Twitter is the reason why I had to watch TV shows on time as opposed, you know, streaming allows us to watch it in our own time. But I realized if I don't watch the TV show on time, then I'm going to get spoilers because people are live tweeting this. And so, right. So, it's, it's it's life. It's not just activism. But then again, black folks on Twitter have been instrumental to amplifying the messages of activists, amplifying the movement, amp you know the movement for Black Lives. You know, from Ferguson, I think one of the um, you know a friend of mine, Jacob Groshek. Um, did a study that showed that, that black activists in Ferguson were bigger hubs for information sharing than were mainstream journalists um, during during the protest there, which right I just find so empowering that the 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 you know we are able to bypass the traditional media gatekeepers to get our message out. Um, and so, you know, that, that's something that excites me. And so of course I do discuss black Twitter uh, um, in the book. Um, but you know, I, I right I I talk about how I am focusing not on the big name events right I, of course I talk about the movement for Black Lives the hashtag Black Lives Matter but that is not the focus of the book I think that that is something that has been talked about a lot that we all um, are, are familiar with the ways it's been changing our national consciousness and what I'm more focused on in this book or, or right the everyday people how everyday people are experiencing race and racism online how everyday people are engaging in acts of resistance that may not make the news. Um, but are still changing the ways and transforming the ways that we understand and experience and respond to racism um, online. And, and then hopefully the, those things, you know, uh, um, get translated into to face to face forms of resistance as well. I want to go back to the interviews that you did with the students of color around the country. Were there any particular stories that they told you that stood out in your mind that you would like to talk about as specific examples of what we're discussing today? Yeah, yeah, I can tell a couple examples. Um, you know, so so one is is um, a student told me about a um, kind of a joke that had been posted to a, a campus page that um, was a picture of a black dining hall employee reading the school newspaper and just captioned that picture with ha ha. And this student felt like that was a racist, you know, image that, that it, was, it was kind of making fun of this black working class man reading as if that's something that doesn't make sense. Right. You kind of had this old racist adage. If you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. Um, and so people commented on it and said, hey, this is racist. Take it down. And the person who made the joke initially said, oh, no, no, I wasn't even thinking about race. You know, you guys are racist for making this about race when really for me, it's just about the school newspaper because who reads that? And you can imagine this type of explanation is being very uh, convincing in a face to face setting. In order to challenge that explanation, you'd have to call the guy a liar. Or right, worse, you'd have to call him uh, in a racist. No, you're racist, and right, and 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 I'm sticking with that explanation. But what you know, some of the reasons why folks of color don't 
challenge uh, racial microaggressions or racist jokes is right. One of the things we're not sure that it is racism. We want right. We tend to believe someone's explanation. Oh no no sorry you misunderstood that. This is not really about race. Um, we right like right like and, and and what happened in this online community is that so many people commented that it legitimated this feeling that this was a joke that came from a negative place, and the poster ended up taking the post down. And so maybe poster did not um, change their heart. But they read that we see kind of a shift in power, whereas instead of folks of color hearing these racist jokes and then being forced to just accept them in silence, being forced to accept a colorblind interpretation of the joke, that here we have an example of people just commenting on it, challenging this idea, right? these kind of racist stereotypes um, in a way that, that changed the powers, changed the power structure, that instead of folks of color feeling like I can't say anything, now this white person who made a racist joke feels like, oh, I can't let this joke be out of here because I am experiencing consequences of it. And so right, they just, they, I think that that case really demonstrates this, this shift in power dynamics that can happen online is right. In, in the absence of, you know, institutions, you know, creating um, consequences for people who engage in microaggressive behavior that, that everyday people are creating their own consequences in online settings. And so that, you know, that, that is a, that was a, a you know, a great example, I think, and, and, and um, you know, a story that, that really hammers home some of the points that I try to make in when the hood comes off. And I want to talk a little bit about what are some ways that you feel that online communication differs from face-to-face -face interactions, and particularly you discuss the idea of the the disinhibition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the online disinhibition effect refers to the way that people tend to be more hostile in online communication. So there's just something about not looking a human being in the eye that makes you, you know, feel like you, your actions are disconnected from real world consequences. And then you add on top of that anonymity, people feel like, oh, my name isn't attached. No one will know that this is me. And things tend to get ugly online. Um, and, 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 you know, when, when race comes in, then, right, it's kind of doubly ugly. Now you have racism plus this online disinhibition effect, which is not limited just to discussions about race. Um, and so that, right, that, that really is, you know, explains part of the, the reason why we see increases in overtly racist discussions uh, in online spaces. So that would be right. That would be one of the, the reasons why we see more racism online. Um, but right there are also um, differences in communication online and in person that, that you know, strengthen the movement or strengthen resistance. And so things like people can take their time in, in crafting a response instead of experiencing racism and the moment gets away from you and you didn't know what to say that you're able to take your time and you can, you can say what you mean. You can share the story with a friend. And, and when they say, yes, I do think that that was that had to do with race. It, it justifies the feelings that you had as opposed to feeling like, Oh, maybe I'm being too sensitive in this moment. Right. Or having a, a community that can respond with you that right. And, and many, um, kind of uh, predominantly white settings, folks of color feel alone. And right, they, 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 you know, I've had a countless number of students talk to me about being the only black person in the classroom. And when something black comes up, everybody's looking at you and you have this responsibility to respond. And online, you have that responsibility is lessened because there's more people the, in the community who, who, who see um, what's happening and who can step in. And so um, students talk about, right, folks with activist identities being willing to to stand up and challenge racism in, you know, in, in uh, multiple si situations that mean there's less individual responsibility on, on a one person who's there as now this is a communal uh, effort in, in challenging racism. So there, there are lots of ways that that um, there are lot, lots of, you know, characteristics of online communication that that really facilitate different styles of, of racial discussions um, that can mo that, that can at the same time make uh, make people feel more comfortable expressing explicit forms of racism but then also um, can empower folks and, and help them challenge racism and you mentioned that your book highlights some specific anti-racist tactics that can be used if we want to oppose online racism so can you go into more detail about maybe what some of those tactics are? Yeah, yeah, right. So some of them are, are what I'm describing, that people being willing to speak online, uh, people being willing to, right, instead of folks of color feeling like they're silenced in online spaces, folks of color feeling like they have a voice in online spaces. Um, I had a, a, another student tell me a story of how he used some slang and someone criticized him for using slang right to his face. And this is someone who was not willing to back down. So he said, hey, no, that's problematic for you to say that. 
And the person he was talking to just walked away without a word. So he was not able to engage in a conversation about that incident because the the other his conversation partner or potential conversation partner was was unwilling to engage. So he then went and made a Facebook post about it. And there were hundreds of people that commented on that post over the next week. And so now you have a campus wide discussion of microaggressions and, and race and slang that really, uh, right, like like gave voice to the student who was si- right, who, who, who was unable to respond in, in person because someone was not willing to have that conversation. So I think that 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 uh, um, really folks feeling like that they have the ability to challenge racism where they once felt like they had to suffer it in silence is a is a sea change in the way that we think about experiencing microaggressions from from it being right from the most common way to respond to microaggressions being to not respond to um, a student told me um, when talking about microaggressions he said there's never been a situation where someone has not commented on a post like that to tell them that it's problematic. And so for a student to tell me that that is the norm is just not something that we knew, right? It's not something that is in the research and it is something that is exciting, um, you know, for us to think about, right? How how are words changing the, wor- the world? And so, of course, right, I don't think that, that um, you know, online activism is enough. I think that we need to tie it to, you know, face-to-face methods and, and organizing, uh, you know, folks, uh, you know, human humans over the long term. Um, but I think that it is right. It is having an impact on the way that people think about race and racism. And I think when we look at, you know, the policy changes that, that conservatives in Florida and other states are pushing forward to try to make it illegal to teach race in schools, it shows you that, that they're scared of, you know, of, of the, the the budding consciousness that's happening uh, as the as the movement is changing the way that people um, think about it, and understand racism. And I understand you're also making a film that's in post-production right now. That's right. That's right. It's called Choose Your Own Resistance. It is a film shot in 360 degrees for VR headsets um, that explores different ways of responding to racism. And so the film um, actually comes out of research that that right that, that the purpose is to examine the barriers to challenging racism and then to to model different ways of challenging them and the causes and you know the causes uh, and and uh, consequences of speaking up or not speaking up to racism. Um, so it's a multi-perspective, multi-ending film that that you know we're very excited about. Um, I've just I've just started doing some beta testing. I think we have some final sound design things that are going on now. Um, but yeah, yeah. So you know, very very excited about it. Um, you know, I, I think I think it'll be done um, in about a month or so, and then we'll be rolling it out, using it for research, but then also thinking about um, some some you know uh, submitting it for film festivals and things like that. How would that work at a film festival if it's for a VR headset? So lots of festivals now have a VR XR component so that they, right. You have the feature length films, you got your documentaries, you got your short films, and then they will have kind of a VR section. Um, and so, you know, for some folks that could be setting up a room or other folks, it just means having a headset in a space where people are free to turn around. Um, and so, right. It, 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 you know, it's, it, it's pretty simple that I can, um, I can give you a headset in a coffee shop and you can experience this as long as someone's watching out for you to make sure that you don't bump into to, to someone walking behind you. Right. That is pretty, it, you know, it's pretty easy to to share VR experiences. Um, you know, they're, they're mobile. And what made you decide to create a film in that um, format? Yeah. So my partners uh, who I worked with are, are Barry Powell's and Melissa Tang. And, um, and Barry is someone who has done, you know, a number of VR films. And so um I got I got to know them because they asked me to help them evaluate a, another film that they had made, um, looking at uh, um, things that incarcerated women felt anxious about as they're approaching getting out of prison. Um, and, and so, you know, I helped I helped them plan the evaluation. And then I, after I asked them, hey, would you all be interested in, in making another one? And I told them about some of my ideas with the research. And so that just led to. The partnership over several years as we we sought funding and then we filmed about a year ago and it's been in post-production uh since then and so it's been a really it's been really exciting to partner with people right melissa's an artist barry's a filmmaker um and so this 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 film really is a collaboration where you know there are so many talented people involved you know it, it's funny for an academic like we have lots of collaboration with co-authors 
but they're typically people who are in academia. And I, I really enjoyed working with folks who are, you know, creatives uh, for their day jobs. And I think that, that that brought a lot of energy to, you know, to to this, you know, um, academic and, and, and forcing me to get out of the ivory tower, which is really, you know, what I want to do with the work. And what is your all time favorite science fiction book? Ooh, I know. Not um, a fair question. <laughs> No, no, that's all right. That's all right. Um, oh man, I get you know this. Uh, I said science fiction. I guess I'm thinking. I feel like I put science fiction and fantasy together. I don't know if Lord of the Rings would count, but that's that's what I would say. If I had to think about just a science fiction book, maybe more. Uh, I would think about the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. Um, but again, I, I I put those two together. Right, right. I, I allow the genres to to go to you know to fit together. And what's up next for you? What projects are you currently working on? I'm currently working on the film. That's what I'm doing now is um, finishing the the film and then figuring out ways, right? I think about it as being both an, uh, you know, being art and intervention. And so what's next is evaluating the film and, and measuring its, uh, its effects on, on people. And, and, you know, do, do people feel more or less stressed when they witness a response to racism versus um, seeing racism without a response. And, and, and so really the, the goal of this is to think about uh, resistance as the potential barrier to the harmful effects of racism and think about, you know, encouraging people to right or, or teaching and training people to be, to feel comfortable and confident to challenge racism in their everyday lives. And is there anything else you'd like to tell us about you or your work? Oh, no, I, you know, I appreciate these questions. This is a great discussion. If folks are, you know, um, interested in getting the book, you can get it anywhere books are sold, um, you know, from Amazon to Barnes to your local bookshop. Just you can ask them to order it if it's, if it's not there. Um, if, if folks are interested in, in hearing updates from me, I'm on Twitter at Rob Eshman. I'm on Instagram at Rob.Eshman. Um, and then I have a website, RobEshman.com. And I will put a link to your website and to the book on Amazon in the show notes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It was great to have you on the show, Rob. Thank you so much for taking time to be a guest on the Curious Professor podcast. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. And now for the answer to this episode's trivia question. What percentage of adults in the USA use Facebook and Instagram? According to Statista, in 2021, 69% of adult Americans said they use Facebook, now rebranded as Meta, and 40% said they used Instagram. We'll end the show with something punny. Why did the computer crash? Because it had a bad driver. (laughs) Thank you for joining me for this episode of The Curious Professor Podcast. If there's a person, place, artifact, or natural wonder that has sparked your curiosity and you'd like for me to feature it on the show, please let me know. My website is thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to subscribe to The Curious Professor Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you'd like to become part of my community of curiosity seekers, be sure to visit my website, thecuriousprofessorpodcast.com, and join Dr. B's Hive. Until next time, always be learning and be curious with Dr. B.